Welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast, a podcast from the home of Scrum. In this podcast, we feature professional Scrum trainers and other Scrum practitioners sharing their stories and experiences to help learn from the experience of others. This episode is a previous recording of our live Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer series, where a live audience asks questions of professional Scrum trainers. We hope you enjoy this episode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located. Welcome to today's Ask Professional Scrum Trainer session. I'm Lindsay Velasino with Scrum.org, and I will will be moderating the session today. And I am very lucky to have with me today three professional Scrum trainers from one of our partners, Responsive Advisors. We have Rob Pieper, Greg Crown, and Jason Malmstadt here. So we are ready to kick this off. Very quickly about Scrum.org, we are the home of Scrum. We were founded by Ken Schwaber in 2009. Our mission is to help people and teams solve complex problems, and we do so through our professional Scrum training. We have over 350 professional Scrum trainers globally, and we also offer professional Scrum certification and lots of ongoing learning opportunities like this webinar. So please check those out on our website, and I know that The Responsive Advisors guys here put out some great content on our blog, so please be sure to check that out as well. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Rob to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. I have a Roomba that I need to pause because it somehow found its way into my room and just started making all kinds of noise. (laughs) Good start. Um, My name is Rob Pieper. I have been a professional scrum trainer officially now 10 years. Uh, It was 10 years this spring, I guess. Um, Shocking. I've never done anything for 10 years except for breathe. But um, I I teach a variety of courses. I just got the PSM2 license after working on that for about three years, uh, fairly inactively, but um, it's done. National public speaker, I I've spoken at a lot of conferences, at least pre-pandemic, and um, uh, only a few since the pandemic has eased. And I will actually be speaking at the PMI, is it called the Global Gathering? I don't know what they called it this year, but it's in Atlanta in October. So if you are really into PMI, PMP, XYZ certification stuff, I I don't know what other certifications they have besides PMP. Um, I'll be there. Ask me your hardest questions on my talk on Agile Transformations. other quick things about me into music. I mean, I'm in my music studio when I do my training classes as well as today. And uh, I say I've been in te- to tech since 86 because that's when I first started programming a Commodore 64. So uh, for those of you who started your programming careers as children, <laughs> um, yes. I was just trying to learn to make video games and just found programming fascinating. And it kind of kicked off a lifelong career in tech and scrum. And, you know, it's just been a snowball of craziness. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit about me. Very cool. Oh, so you're next. next. Right? All right. Uh, so I'm the uh, uh, one of the agile coaches and uh, trainers for responsive advisors as well, and uh, also the CTO. Um, I've been a professional Scrum trainer for, uh, gosh, I think since 2019. So I can't do the math. It's about four years now, um, something like that. But uh, since uh, since then, um, been able to uh, acquire a number of uh, classes that I can teach. Um, recently added the uh, PAL-E and I'm pursuing adding the evidence-based management course as well. I'm pretty excited about that one. That's a good topic. Um, so for my background, I've got the theology as my foundation with education. That's an interesting uh, launching point for my career. Um, I've got uh, about 10 years in construction in which I would say I learned most about uh, product management um, at that point in time and uh, customer engagement. Some uh, pretty high profile clients gave uh, opportunity for that experience there. I've run a couple of businesses and have now uh, joined forces of the responsive advisors uh, to continue to uh, grow this company and help people because that's what we love to do. So yeah, things I like to do, I suppose. I'm hanging out with my puppy dog. He will not be on the call. I gated him off. He might be a little too disruptive. Uh, but hanging out with him, uh, my 15-month-old daughter, and uh, yeah, just having a good time, enjoying life. Cool. Okay, and Jason? I think that leaves me. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Jason Momstead, um, also a professional Scrum trainer. I've been teaching Scrum uh, for several years, but I joined the Scrum.org community uh, last year. So I've been a professional Scrum trainer coming up on a year now. 
Um, my background's in software development. I spent about the first decade of my career uh, writing code for medical devices, uh, which is pretty fun uh, and also very high pressure uh, because you know that a software bug could adversely you know, affect a patient. So, um, but I've, I've used Scrum for many years. I love being a Scrum master. I've had some experience as a product owner, a developer, um, and now I get to teach with these guys at Responsive Advisors and uh, really love training. That's uh, I have a, a theatrical background, and I think that kind of works its way into my training as well. It's a little bit like being on stage, I suppose. Uh, when I'm not working, I'm a vocalist, and my my joke that I tell in every class is a, a vocalist is like being a singer, uh, but the word vocalist sounds cooler. Um, <laughs> you'll see my wall of nerdery on my uh, slide there. I like uh, Lord of the Rings and Zelda and Mario and Star Wars and all those good things. Uh, and I've got two young kids who, much like Greg's dog, should not be making any appearances in this webinar, but they're kids. You never know. So that's me. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So I am going to stop sharing because it is time for questions. Get to some Q&A. Yes. So just a reminder to everybody on the call today, please make sure that you are entering your questions into the Q&A box and not the chat. Let's utilize the chat for any um, comments that you want to make or chatter and that type of thing. And then let's utilize the Q&A for your questions. Okay, so this first one here. So blurred lines between Scrum Masters and Project Manager as expectations of roles. Want to talk about those blurred lines a little bit? Let's start with you, Jason. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was just talking to somebody yesterday uh, about this who came from a project management background and said, you know, that Scrum Master is basically the same thing, right? And uh, she was very surprised to see that a Scrum Master's responsibility is not to manage people, not to manage tasks, really not to have any decision-making authority uh, other than perhaps upholding Scrum. Um so, you know, I, I, I tell people that Scrum Master is much more like a team coach, much more involved in coaching a team to be self-managing, coaching a team to be more effective, uh, sometimes removing impediments, but more often helping them learn how to manage their own impediments. So, um, you know, can a project manager become an effective Scrum Master? Absolutely. I've seen it many times, but you have to get your head around the idea that you're no longer in charge of managing, managing time, budget, and scope. You're acting much more like a coach, a facilitator, um, and and just helping a team be the best they can be. Curious if I, uh, Rob or Greg, have anything to add there? Greg, I'll give this to you. <laughs> uh, my uh, um, my my short answer to this one, uh, and in compliment to what Jason's already mentioned, is uh, project managers. They're managing projects. We're scrum masters. They're managing the effectiveness of the scrum framework, uh, both for the team and at the organizational level. Um, so once once you identify what the difference is, uh, the lines aren't as blurred. But I think what maybe is at the gist of the question is oftentimes organizations still blur those lines. Uh, maybe it's stated, we need a scrum master, but the expectation by way of the job description is project management. And um, that, uh, is, that's an unfortunate reality that's not, uh, uh, that's not very helpful and not very conducive to helping scrum become effective. Um, so I'm trying to read into the question a little bit, thinking that might be uh, sort of at the seat of it there. Okay, great. Anything to add, Rob, or are we good? I think they pretty much got it. Fantastic. All right. So this next question from James. So a little background about James here. I am new to Scrum coming from a health and social care management background. I have been in the Scrum Master role for a couple of months now. I've been reading lots of theory and have booked to take the PSM1 qualification. I wondered what you would advise to someone new to the Scrum Master role and how to overcome some of the barriers of technical knowledge coming from a non-technical role. Oh. I can go for this one. Okay. Uh, so it. sure, it helps to have technical knowledge, but at the end of the day, a Scrum Master doesn't really solve technical problems that developers are there to solve. Uh, so from, from an empathy perspective, if you can learn a little bit about their domain, that will help. Um, if you can pair up with 
somebody with a lot more technical experience than you, and they can translate the uh, geek speak into something that you can understand, that'd be great. Um, a lot of the challenges you will likely hear from technical professionals are, oh, it's really hard to break down work into small enough pieces that can be done in a sprint. You don't understand. And you got to understand why they're they're saying that. It, oftentimes, it's uh, if you look back, it's it's waterfall behaviors that are kind of coming through as they're um, trying to implement Scrum. By waterfall behaviors, I mean like let's spend six months building a database no one can use to get it just perfect uh, before we start building anything on top of it. And that would be the same as like building an entire city just by starting with all the plumbing and roads before a single taxpayer moves in. So you can learn a lot from Sim City. Uh, I learned everything I know about <laughs> merchant architecture from Sim City, the video game. But uh, th those are my thoughts. It's helpful to understand it, but really uh, a technique you're going to use as a scrum master is asking a lot of questions and sometimes just being a good rubber duck. Because when people explain their problem to you, sometimes they go, oh, duh, I just figured it out. Greg and I do this to each other all the time. Yeah, you yeah. might, uh, for somebody who's not technical, you may need to uh, explain what rubber ducking is because I think that is traditionally a technical thing in and of yeah. itself. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. So Google yeah. that, but ultimately imagine Greg is a, a big yellow rubber duck and can't say a thing. And I have to explain my problem to a rubber duck, which means I got to be very clear because the rubber duck cannot ask me questions. And with the idea that there's a good possibility as I'm working my way through the problem to explain it, I will have arrived at my own solution. Yeah, I, I've I've been a scrum master both when I understood the technical background, because that is my background, and I've been a scrum master when I didn't. And I feel like I was often more effective when I didn't, when I when I purposely kept myself from getting in the details, because when I knew the technical details, then I would then I would be tempted to start solving problems instead of just revealing them. So don't sell yourself short just because you don't have the technical knowledge. If you can get good at saying, "Tell me more," why is that? Can you explain? Can you explain more of that? I'm reminded of what Simon Sinek famously said in a video that he's often the stupidest person in the room by his own admission. He's like, "I'm just the idiot, and I'm willing to ask good questions." Um, if you can do that, you'll probably be a pretty effective Scrum Master. That's great advice. Thank you. All right. This next one is somewhat related um, from Jeremy here. Can you talk about Scrum use and team management outside of software development? I am an engineering manager running Scrum with a team doing product evaluations, for example, labs, um, lab work, as well as designing integrated systems with these products. What are some of the key areas of Scrum that people get wrong when applying it outside of software? Mm -hmm. Is it my turn to take one of these? Well, yes, Greg. Go know. for it. <clears throat> well, um, all right. I, I like that we're uh, applying this outside of uh, purely software. And uh, I think we need to to accept the fact that the the scrum framework helps us with complexity that is that's going to be the thing that we need to lean into so um what whether the technology or the subject matter is software or not uh what can we look at to say where do people typically uh get scrum wrong in these environments and i would say um the the thing that we see pretty much on repeat is the difficulty for teams and i would even uh um, argue management layer or even executive level um, have a difficult time with clearly communicating goals that are customer outcome driven and so when that uh when that's missing um that kind of creates a trickle back or a feedback loop into your scrum team regardless of what it is that you're trying to to solve problem wise or what your environment is um, that creates a lot of dysfunction and noise. So the way Scrum can actually be super beneficial and effective is when teams are self-managing, but that only happens when we have a common goal. So a lot of inspiration can come from various sports activities, team sports, where you've got uh, very centric goals that everyone rallies behind and they understand what the full purpose is. Um, but in traditional environments, there's a huge tendency to divide and conquer. Everybody's doing their own thing. And uh, one of my favorite examples Jason gives, uh, gives in his class is imagine getting a print off list of a bunch of directions from MapQuest. Um, and then you just put those papers all over the place. And it's like, cool, let's assemble a road trip. I mean, that doesn't really work that way. We need to know where we're going so we know what directions to take. Um, so I'd say one of the key key aspects that often get uh, we get wrong within um, these scrum teams is not having goals that really help the team focus 
and be able to rally together to go the same direction. And again, customer outcomes, that's the, that's the bent. But if you're in an environment in which customer might be internal, um, then that might be something that you just have to define who is your customer? Who is it that we're looking for those outcomes? I would just add to that. I think that I would totally agree with you, Greg. And, and I would just add to that. Remember what the whole point of Scrum is. It's to have a, a done working increment that can deliver value sure. and that we can learn from. So in software, yeah, that's a releasable package of usable software. Okay, so what's your product? I, I don't know what you mean by product evaluations in a lab, but maybe your product is really a service that provides evaluation mm -hmm. of a pro you know other products. Okay, what's an increment of that product? Right. It could be it could be much more efficient to try to evaluate 10 products simultaneously. But are you going to get to a done increment, a, an evaluated product? Probably not. So you probably want to turn it on its head and say, we want to get to a, an evaluated product as quickly as possible. You start by asking, what's the smallest thing we can do to provide real value? 10% more of three evaluated products is not real value, but one evaluated product might be real value. And so figuring out what is an increment of my product, I think that's where it begins, especially when you're outside of software. With software, it's just easier to get there because, you know, came from software and, and we know what an increment looks like because we get increments of software on our phones every day. But for outside of software, you have to ask yourself, what, how can I provide value in a really small and incremental and iterative way? I'll just pile on just a quick thing because I'd, I'd hate to spend 20 minutes answering each question as we'll only get you out of them. <laughs> Uh, my quick thought on that is whatever you make is likely valuable to someone, identify that someone and keep making smiles on their face with small things. And when they don't like what you're making, if you're making things in small pieces, you can quickly change direction. And that's the whole point of, of Scrum in terms of its incremental delivery. So whatever you're doing, you got to figure out where the smiles are, produce them in small pieces. Uh, obviously, the smaller, the better, because you can constantly adapt and constantly uh, put those smiles out there. That's great. Thank you. Great advice from all of you there. So this next question comes from Christina. Christina asks, how should we manage incidents and bugs when our scrum team also has to attend to the operation and support of the project? How about you, Jason? Sure. I, I've worked with a lot of teams. I've been a, a Scrum Master and a developer on a team that was working this way where we were building a product, but we also had to support it as we were building it. And we thought we we looked at a couple different ways. First, we were like, maybe we should just build in some buffer time in our sprints. We we have some empirical data that sprint over sprint, about 10 to 20 percent of our sprint is is spent working on bugs and incidents that we hadn't planned on. And so maybe we should just build in a buffer. We tried that for a while, but the problem there is that you're just absorbing it and you it's easier to treat everything as an emergency. So instead, we started planning what I would call full sprints. We, you know, assuming that we were going to spend the whole sprint on building our product, you know, taking things from our product backlog. And then when incidents came in, we had a choice to make. Are we going to add it to the current sprint, assuming we can still meet our sprint goal, of course? Um, and if we do, something else is going to drop off. And is fixing this bug really more valuable than this thing, other thing that we had planned on? And so having that trade-off made it much more transparent, both within our team and to our stakeholders. We could say, yeah, we took on these bugs because, you know, our product owner or we as a team decided fixing this bug was more valuable right now than this other thing that we had originally planned on. And we could get feedback on, did we make the right choice or not and, and learn from that? So um you know, when in doubt, I go back to transparency, make make your decision making process as transparent as possible. It shouldn't just be a single developer saying, oh, a bug came in, I'm going to jump on it, like have a team discussion, you're you're updating your sprint backlog when you do that. So have a team discussion, bring your product owner and make sure you're all aligned and make sure you're holding the sprint goal sacrosanct. Um, and yeah, and just make those decisions as transparent as possible. That's great. Thank you. All right. So this next question, we'll give this one to you, Rob. What are some of your favorite retrospective ideas? Mm. We're not doing these in order, are we? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm, I was I'm like, jumping around a little bit. There's no order. There's no order, Rob. <laughs> yeah, there is no order. What, there's okay, no order. order. And just so the audience knows, um, I'm not purposely skipping over questions. I'm just trying to get some from the bottom, some from the top, so we can kind of 
keep it even for everybody since our, our time here is a little bit limited. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. There's no rhyme or reason really to the questions that I am picking just so the audience knows. All right, go ahead, Rob. All right, my favorite retrospective ideas. Um, well, one of my favorite questions to ask is if you had a magic wand, how would you solve that problem? Or, you know, if you had a billion dollars or whatever, it, the, the main, yeah, the main idea being like, let's take away all constraints, all organizational problems, all deficiencies that are blocking you from coming up with a solution. If you could do anything, what would it be? And then sometimes that helps jog people's minds a little bit to get them to go, well, if I had a billion dollars, I'd buy this, I would do this, I'd hire these people. And somewhere in there, you might find a solution to your problem. Uh, but it's not until you, you remove all barriers to idea creation uh, until you find it. So that would be one of my favorite retrospective. Uh, the question was about retrospective ideas or questions. I think it was just ideas, right? It, it was ideas, but maybe some facilitation tips would be helpful here too. Oh God, I'm a bad facilitator. I'm. I'm I, <laughs> I got one, I, Rob. Oh, if you got an answer, you go for it. You guys are way more creative with the facilitation than I am. All right. Um, well, th this comes with a little bit of a story, but uh, when I was a um, uh, scrum master for um, a smaller startup team, uh, I was uh, late to retrospective. Well, I was nearly late. I wasn't quite late. I was going to be on time within about 30 seconds. And I came uh, rolling in the door realizing, uh-oh, I think I'm supposed to facilitate retrospective in 30 seconds. So I came up with this brilliant idea that uh, I'm saying brilliant in quotes, people can't see that in the podcast. Uh, but um, I had this idea that uh, uh, maybe if I asked the group what they uh, identified with during this last sprint by way of a Muppet, I might get some interesting results. So I posed the question, if you could identify with a Muppet, and of course uh, you would have to be a Muppet fan and I knew my team. Um, if you could identify with a Muppet this last sprint, which Muppet were you? And then uh, I got a quick response from somebody saying, somebody didn't prepare for a retrospective. <laughs> and then I went and got a cup of coffee while they were all thinking about their Muppets. So they had to go um, find their favorite Muppet on uh, Google, find an image of it. And we all presented the Muppet images and explained why we felt we were this Muppet during the last sprint. And we got some ridiculously good insights. You got the appeal towards emotion because Muppets are very emotional looking critters. Like right. why do the wild and crazy, you know, why is that expression on their face? Why do they look angry? Why do they look like they are, you get the idea. Um, so that was a really fantastic way to break the ice, to be able to get people to dig a little bit deeper to the emotion and feeling of a, uh, of a sprint instead of purely uh, looking at the tactics. And then from that, we're able to get some uh, nice cohesion with thoughts as a result and have some actionables. But uh, Muppet retrospective is one of my favorite ideas or something like that. And I, I think that's a great example of a broader point that I had to learn when I, from when I was a new scrum master to as I, as I got a bit more seasoned. It's not about rigidly adhering to any of the facilitation structures out there. If you do the speedboat or the hot air balloon or mad right. sack or like like learn, like it can be really tempting to be like, no, you have to have two in each category and they can't overlap. And like, it's not about that. Just let go. If you're having a good conversation, who cares if it overlaps two categories or if you make a new category on the fly? One of my best retrospectives, we had a set facilitation technique in mind. And at the end, I could tell that there was just something else we needed to get out there. So I just threw out a fourth topic and added more things to it like the the conversation and the ability to come up with a continuous improvement item is way more important than rigid mm -hmm. adherence to any of the structures great thank you all right this next question here so we have identified developer test notes as an impediment for the team due to inconsistency i have completed some research and found a template I had a meeting today with the team to agree to that template and get feedback for changes, as well as agreeing some, agreeing on some rules for the test notes. I wonder how you would look at implementing and monitoring this change. Greg, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'm kind of might need this some out. more context too. Yeah, so was, feel free to ask James for more context in the chat. That is okay. 
Um, yeah, looking at this, so developer test notes as an impediment. Um, some research found a template, meeting today of the team, agree to the template, getting feedback for changes, as well agreeing to some rules for the test notes. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, basically what James is is hinting at here is a, um, it's an experiment. Um, so based on what was felt as a impediment, we need to prove whether or not it was an impediment by way of this experiment. So I think of finding something that, and I, I like some key words in the question that you've agreed upon as something to try as a team. Awesome. So these general sense of rules around how we might go about this, um, I think actually appeal to uh, some of the scrum values that give uh, respect and openness for change uh, so we can focus on doing the right thing. And so, um, so far, I'm thinking that this is a good suggestion. Now, the question is, how do you monitor the change? Um, well, there's another retrospective ahead of you. And one thing that I've done as a practice is keep track of the things that you hope to see um, uh, see the team in integrate by way of changes and updates uh, as improvements. And then periodically go back and look at those improvements and say, did they work? In fact, we just did this with our team um, within our, our corporate uh, retrospective. We did this and said, hey, we're going to look back and visit the last six improvements. Did these make a difference? Yes or no. And if they didn't make a difference, we quit doing those things. And so we're able to look at a bucket of things that we hope to do differently. And with that say, yeah, that made a big impact. That had nominal impact or that really didn't do what we think. Let's quit it. Because if you basically introduced a new activity for the team and it's not making the impact you hope for, you should probably undo the experiment. Uh, try something else and uh, see if that uh, see if that helps. So monitor the change. I would say it's less about uh, graphing it or finding a chart and maybe just checking in, saying did it work, um, and even let the team maybe make that assessment uh, throughout the sprint as they're uh, making those notes. Because if it's if it's causing more frustration than help, uh, maybe it's time to rethink it. I don't know if that helps, James, but uh, it's my thoughts. I'm reminded of a quote from uh, the book Scrum Mastery by Jeff Watts. Good Scrum Masters hold their teams accountable. Great Scrum Masters teach their teams to hold themselves accountable. Mm. So if you're the Scrum Master, James, this might not be your job to monitor its progress. You might be better served coaching the team to figure out for themselves, is this helping or is it not? Awesome. Thank you. All right. This next question comes from Marcus. So what amount of technical experience and knowledge is a must to be a, an effective scrum master? Second to that, is it a red flag if there is a shift in expectations from the organization for a scrum master to have sufficient technical knowledge? Give this one to you, Jason. Yeah. Hey, Marcus. Marcus is a friend of mine, former colleague. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, as, as Greg was, or I'm, seeing, I'm sorry, as Rob was saying earlier, um, you know, it can help to empathize with the with the technical developers on your team. You know, if if they're talking about a problem, and it's you know all Greek or all geek to you, uh, you you know, and you can't even relate to what they're talking about. I think that that can be a problem. I don't think you have to have deep technical knowledge, as I said before. I, I've been better served sometimes when I had high level understanding of the technical problems, but not a detailed level, because then I wasn't tempted to get in there and and start solving the developers' problems for them. Is it a so I don't think you have to have deep technical knowledge, but understanding broad brush strokes, I think is is helpful. Is it a red flag? I think it could be. I, I've worked for a company that just simply made a decision. We're going to have our our scrum masters have technical backgrounds. Um, it was kind of an accidental pattern for that company, and they thought it served them well. And so that was how they hired. Um in that case, the company understood what a scrum master was and what a scrum master wasn't and didn't try to morph the, the accountability into something that's not meant to be. In your case, a company that could be a red flag that the company is kind of shifting what the scrum master is supposed to be. So I'd, I'd start digging and asking questions of management. Why, why are we doing this change? What are the expectations for the accountability in the future? Is the expectation that scrum masters are somehow the final decision maker for all technical challenges on a team like that would be a huge red flag for me but it could just be that they've noticed a pattern and they want to continue that pattern and so I, I think more context is needed anything else from rob or greg 
Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. So uh, if you have Scrum Masters that aren't actually demonstrating the value of what a master in Scrum means to an organization, they're going to find ways for you to do other work, like go lift those boxes, make me coffee, go write some code, uh, be our project manager. And I find that if you don't have enough experience with Scrum as a Scrum Master, you don't realize there's like a million really important jobs for you to be doing, like causing the removal of impediments. And when you don't do those jobs, you're stuck just facilitating meetings. And frankly, nobody wants to pay you to facilitate meetings um, unless you're really, really inexpensive. So uh, they're, they're trying to find other ways for you to add value in problems that they actually have sometimes. I don't know if this is your problem, but you know, if you're a former coder that's become a scrum master, it's a hard pill for people to swallow to have to pay you at a programmer's salary to be a scrum master. And so hybridization of your roles starts to emerge. It doesn't mean you can't add value in other ways. As a matter of fact, if like you can put your Scrum Master hat off to the side and do those other things that need to be done, uh, you might be of extreme value to your organization. However, if you break the fundamental mechanics of how Scrum works, like violating self-management principles, ignoring empiricism, not removing impediments, well, then you're not serving the Scrum role all that well, and I would focus a little more on that. So. Just making up context, assuming your question is somewhere in that category of common problems I've seen. So those are my thoughts. Great, thank you. All right, so this next question here comes from Scott. As a coach, I had a recent question to talk about transitioning from Scrum Master to PO. Um, at the most basic level, I don't see many common characteristics or skills other than understanding the Scrum framework. Any advice for somebody looking to make that move? I think many on a Scrum team see the PO at the top, in quotes, and see it as a natural career step, but I don't see it that way. Ooh. So we'll give that to you, Greg. Man. Um... Yeah, transitioning from Scrum Master to PO. That's um, these are two very different accountabilities. Like the idea of a transition, I don't even know if is uh is a is really the, the best word to use there. Um, that's uh they're just two different accountabilities straight up. Um, since a product owner's primary responsibility is that of uh, maximizing value with product management activities. If a scrum master who might be really good at interfacing with people and empathy and they are accountable for team health needs to shift their mindset over to maximizing value and becoming a really, really good product manager, that's a huge step. Um, sometimes that could take months to learn or years to learn how to become a really good product manager and really a product owner. That's, that's what they are as an agile product manager. So um, shifting or just transitioning over to as if it's just kind of a here, take this quick class, read this book and you're good to go. It's not that um, that's going to be a, a, a pretty major shift for that individual. Now, if they've already got some product management experience in their back pocket, I'm missing that from the question, um, but it is not an easy, simple um, transition. Um, and I, I will add to the point that uh, the idea of a product owner being the top, um, it is a whole team. There isn't really a top role within the scrum team. Everybody has their accountability and the scrum master's accountability to make and help the product owner become really, really effective in combination with how the developers do their work and accomplish done increments every single sprint. Um, they work holistically. You know, that'd be kind of like saying that uh, um, your left tackle isn't that important in a football team um, when the quarterback would say, oh, yes, they are. They help make my job a lot easier. Um, we got to have all these people working together. So um, uh, hopefully we've answered that question there, or at least maybe put some, shed some light onto it. I'm curious if Jason or Rob have anything else to add. <clears throat> I, different focuses. One is managing a product and making sure that it's the most valuable it can be. And one is in effect, helping a team to self-manage to be the most effective team it can be. And they're there's very little overlap aside from the fact that you're helping a team be effective in the context of developing a product, but your day-to-days will be different. Your focuses will be different. Your backgrounds are likely going to be different. In one, you want to be a master of the product that you're developing to make sure it's the best thing ever. And you're constantly improving on that. And in the other, you're a master of scrum where you're constantly trying to get better at understanding scrum 
and teaching others how it works, mentoring, advising, things like that. So very different roles. And yeah, there's no top of the food chain on a scrum team. Okay, that is great. Thank you. All right. So this next question is a humdinger. So um, <laughs> this question from Andre, um, how do you convince people to change? As as we all know, most people are resistive to change and it can be tough to push them towards something new, especially if they have been working or got used to a process being in a certain way for many years. I'll give this one to you, Rob. Great, great. I'll take the hardest <laughs> of them all. Um, but Fantastic. fortunately for us, I have an answer already in my back pocket. Uh, can I put links in this tool? Absolutely. Just make sure you filter to everyone so everybody gets them. I've got it under hosts and panelists. Is there an everyone option? Yes, there is. I don't see it. Should be underneath. Okay, if you do not, you can send it to me and well, I will it, send it to everyone. I'll tell you what, like yeah. just if you go to the ProSci Institute, P-R-O-S-C-I uh, dot com, they have a framework called ADKAR, A-D-K-A-R. And if you just Google that, you're going to end up at the same place. Um, it's a it's an organizational change management framework that starts with basically the individual. And so I'll just kind of walk through what ADKAR means at a high level. And I do not have a certification uh, of their stuff. So take this with a grain of salt, do your own digging. But ultimately, it's hard to get people to make a change if they're not A, aware, aware of why this change is valuable to them. Like, how is this going to affect me? If D, you don't desire that change, even if you are aware of it and you know, you're know you aware there are some benefits, maybe you just don't care, uh, then you won't make that change. If you are aware and you do desire, but you don't have the knowledge and how to implement the change successfully, that's the K, uh, you don't get very far in making it work. And then the next A on ADCAR is ability. If you don't have the ability to use it at the right performance level, like, hey, I, I love Scrum. I went to the Scrum training class. I came back to work and my organization's like, no, we're not using that. It's stupid. You kind of use it or lose it. You'll forget about how it works after six months of not being able to apply it. Maybe a year, it's just out the door. Uh, and then the last one is reinforcement. So if you're not getting constant reinforcement and constant leveling up and constant polishing the stone and on your skills, it won't stick. And so that's, that is really where I would go to helping people make that change. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay sent out the link to everyone. Um, I would start learning more about that because for me, the 99% of the problems with getting scrum stick are people problems. And a big part of that is ineffective change management. People want to push scrum on people like you're upgrading a windows computer and it just, people don't take a change like that. Yeah, I'll I've, I'll add just a couple of things. Uh, one that I had to learn ex experimentally or experientially that, um, well, the Scrum Guide says so. That may motivate <laughs> those of us that are really into Scrum, but for your average person, they don't care. <laughs> like, or at least it's not sufficient. Like that might be good to get them started or help them explain where you're coming from, but you have to help them see the why. You have to help them see the benefit. Like the Scrum Guide says we have to do a retrospective is not going to convince someone who's resistant to change. So help them help them connect, explain it if you can, or help them connect the event or the, you know, the change that, that you're trying to help them make to the why. Um, lead them there and help them see the benefit. Um, treating things as experiments is another way. Like, you know, we're not saying we have to do this for all time. We're going to experiment with this. Like Greg was saying before, we're going to experiment with this and then we're going to evaluate it. There's a lot within a scrum team that you can say, we're going to keep this if it helps us and we're going to throw away if we're not, not core pieces of the framework. We're not going to treat like the events that way, but specific tactics within the framework, you can absolutely experiment with. Um, and then finally, I just, I don't think you can convince someone to change. You can help them, you can help coach them, but ultimately they have to make the decision for themselves. Yeah, that's Great. the tough reality though, isn't it, Jason? Um, uh, sometimes people don't want the change. There's no amount of convincing that could be done. Uh, you can't give them enough money to change. You can't do anything like that. And so uh, I think knowing when that's going to be an uphill battle, you can't really push them into it if they're not willing um, no, I think recognizing the empathy there for people, there's usually fear at the baseline of change. And so uh, anybody who's in charge, and I love the ad car uh, model and being able to take that approach, but there has to be an empathy with the people that are part of that to reduce the amount of fear so that change doesn't feel so intimidating or risky. Most people don't want change because they feel like they're going to lose something as a result. So putting those uh, fears at ease can make a huge difference. Again, they may not want the change 
um, but at least it'll be open to the conversation. This is all great advice. Thank you. All right. So this next question here from Alfred, how would you go about coaching a team to monitor their performance? Hmm. So I'm lacking some context here, but maybe you can share some ideas. Um, I'll give this one to Jason. Sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before, uh, that it really is for, for them to monitor. So if they're looking at you to say, hey, you know, Scrum Master or, you know, product owner, what's our performance? <laughs> you want to remove yourself from the bottle, being the bottleneck or the center of that and help them monitor their own performance. Um, when in doubt, I go to transparency. So what is important to make transparent so that it can be very quickly ascertained, right? If I have to, if I have to take 10 to 15 to 20 minutes to start digging through a tool to try to figure out uh, what's important, it's not going to happen. Like you want, you want something that's at a glance. If you have to build a dashboard or if you have to figure out one metric that matters, that's something that we've talked about internally. Like what one number are we focusing on right now? Um, you, you can't monitor progress of, of simultaneously and focus on 50 different metrics that by definition, you can't focus on 50 different things. So maybe you have to pick just a couple of key metrics right now and make them blindingly obvious. Like you can't walk anywhere or have a meeting without running into it. Um, and then I, I would also just make sure you're measuring what matters that, that, we're not picking a vanity metric that we're not picking, you know, sometimes I'll tell technical developers, would you like it if I, you know, paid you on lines of code written? Probably because you could take twice as long or a hundred times as long to write everything and, and write yourself a new car, but that wouldn't be a very meaningful metric. So make sure that we're not just measuring something that's easy to measure, but something that's actually meaningful. Um, what would you guys add to that? Anything? You get me thinking about the copy, paste, copy, paste, man. You could crank out a lot of code just doing right. that. Right. Um, I, I, I think the word performance, uh, we need to be careful of. So, uh, and, and here's, here's what I'm thinking. Um, we could have, uh, and, and use another sports analogy here. Um, if, if performance is being measured by, um, say, like the number of yards for one person uh, on a football team running, and they say, I've ran so many yards, it's like, right, but did your team win? Did you get, uh, did you accomplish the goal together? Um, to Jason's point, these vanity metrics that sometimes can be the trigger for people saying, I'm so distracted with trying to hit our mark for performance, they absolutely forget why they're even playing the game. And uh, that's uh, that's an unfortunate reality. So rather than um, monitoring their performance, I would love to see a team be aware of why they're playing the game um, and get them into a consistent state. So are they consistently getting their goal achieved every single sprint? And if they aren't, that's enough monitoring to know there's something wrong. <laughs> so let's uh, start getting under the hood and find out what's distracting us from our goal. Maybe we bit off more than we could chew, which is probably the number one thing that most teams do. They have this misconception that your sprint backlog is this giant bucket that we must fill up to the very top to feel like we have absolutely maximized the capacity for our team. So we're the highest performance possible. And then we don't get our goals accomplished, which basically is like having nothing at the end of a sprint. And so what if you filled that bucket half full with one goal? And you got that done every single sprint, and then you're able to tackle some of the other odds and ends. Um, I, I'm cautious of the word performance because that oftentimes will distract from the point, which is value, consistent quality value, instead of how much, how many widgets are we pumping out? A million widgets that nobody wants. I don't want that, but you could say that's extremely performant. So uh, I'd be, ca be cautious of that and uh, maybe point the direction towards uh, what we should be measuring. Your, if your cookies taste like garbage, I don't care how fast you bake them, is what I That's often say to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. All right. So this next question here, any advice for software teams that are working in an operations environment other than to block out a certain percentage of your time to handle emergent operation issues? Emergency, emergent, 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 yeah, either emergent operational issues. Oh, can we do shameless self promotion here? So, <clears throat> I wrote a I wrote a blog post uh, uh, and shared a, a tool on our website not that long ago called the the five W's for unplanned work. 
This is something I developed empirically with a with a client of mine who was constantly getting hit by the kind of emergency issues that you were talking about. Um, you know, this team was even doing one week sprints, which I commonly call scrum on hard mode because it's it's really hard to break your work down uh, and get something meaningful accomplished in a week. And even with the one week sprints, they would, you know, they'd plan their sprint on a Monday and by midday Tuesday, they'd have so many emergencies in air quotes that um, their their sprint plan would be just sunk. And so we just help them think through what these emergencies were from five different uh, dimensions. So the first one was why, why is this an emergency? What happens if, you know, we don't do it? How many people are being affected by this thing? Um, the next one was, is there a workaround? Like often these are, you know, these emergencies are fixing something that's broken. And instead of, you know, sidetracking our whole sprint, could we just do a temporary workaround to, to limp along until we can really get to this in a, in a more planned fashion? Uh, what happens if we just wait? If we just say, no, we're not doing this right now. We have a sprint in, in progress and we'll get to it in a future sprint. Uh, what, what's the impact of that? Maybe it's not catastrophic. Um, where does this fall in relationship to other things in our backlog? Like if we add it to the sprint now, some other things aren't going to get done. Or do we really think this is more important than the other those things? And then finally, if the answer is yes, and it truly is an emergency, we've had a security breach or, or you know, you know our, our whole website's down or, you know, something like that. Okay, what aren't we going to get to? And are we okay with that? Is that, are we making a positive value trade-off here? Um, and of course, you know, keeping our sprint goal sacrosanct um, would be the North Star for that. So um, that's just one way. It's just a way that really helped that, that particular team go from something like 80% unplanned work down to like 20% unplanned work. Um, but, but just really thinking through a lot of things are called emergencies when they really don't have to be. I dropped a link to that blog and the uh, everyone chat. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. This question is interesting. So our sprints are two weeks and this is nowhere near enough time to get development testing approvals for deployment and actual deployment completed. This often takes three sprints. Any advice? I'll give this one to you, Rob. Yes, I was hoping for this one. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, here's my first thought on that. Um, Scrum doesn't require deployment within a sprint, just that you're deployable, meaning I can release this if I so choose. It's now a business decision. And we're decoupling. Do I release from am I releasable? So that's one thing you can just like push off to the side. Uh, some of the other things, if you look at them carefully, you might realize like you've got some impediments. Maybe your testing processes could be faster, like more automation, or maybe if you're testing people around a different team, maybe get them on your team. But you know, if you start take, taking note of every single thing that's slowing you down and preventing you from releasing something of value in two weeks, and then start going after fixing those things, that, that's basically the spirit of impediment removal. Uh, coming up with something valuable in under two weeks, think of that as a design constraint. So you can't build the Eiffel Tower in two weeks, but maybe you can build uh, a supporting structure in that amount of time, a valuable piece of supporting structure that can be built on. Um, and, and we're not going to talk about mechanical sort of applications of Scrum, but if you're in a software space, it's typically very possible to get something done in two weeks, even if you're a one-person team. And the way you would do that is by looking for little tiny bits of value in your solution and, and just working on that and getting it done. And then working on the next piece and then getting that done and see how it interplays with the one you just made. And it just in tiny, tiny, tiny batches, making solutions that solve problems. Uh, when you've got a big, big, big problem, it's usually a combination of a thousand micro problems. And you got to find those micro problems so you can start focusing on getting something useful done in a short time frame. Uh, so if what you're doing is not risky work, sure, make it easy on yourself and go to three weeks. However, if what you're doing is risky, meaning my whole team worked on something for two weeks and just wasted $50,000 of the company's money because we were on the wrong track, I wouldn't keep doing that over and over. Maybe make your sprints even shorter. So sprint length isn't about how hard your work is. It's more about how much risk are you willing to take on doing the wrong thing. So I said a lot of words, but those somewhere in there is uh, my collection of my thoughts on that subject. <laughs> it's great. Thank you. All right, so we have time for maybe one or two more here. Um, this question here from Tom. 
<laughs> this question here from Tom. I started using Scrum in 2004 and introduced it into a Fortune 50 company guided by Ken. I had no development background, but learned to code after I started using Scrum. I feel like Scrum Masters should also develop. And I did that for nearly 10 years. What are your thoughts? So we kind of talked about this already, um, that a Scrum Master does not necessarily have to have the technical skills, but I wonder what your thoughts on Scrum Masters learning to develop. Oh, can I take this one? Sure. I'll be really brief. So um, I think it can be a huge advantage in small teams, small company environments. I know you're talking a Fortune 50 company, so that's a whole different deal. But when you have a culture and an ecosystem in which self-management is just pretty much at the core, um, I think that a Scrum Master who knows how to code or knows how to develop, uh, produce or help produce, be part of the product um, process can be a huge advantage. However, here's the giant red flag caution. Um, I'm going to throw flags all over the statement I just said. You got to pick who you are sometimes. Are you developing today or are you going to be the scrum master today? Because this can be a direct conflict with your accountabilities. So I have seen it work amazingly well, and I've actually seen it be an absolute train wreck for a team and product development. So um, it's a split opinion because it does depend upon the context. It depends on how mature your teams are. And I don't mean age. I mean, how well are they able to self-manage and self-correct and self-improve? Um, what's the culture like? Because given the wrong culture, that could be a train wreck. That's great. Thank you. All right. So I think we have time for one more question. So friends, is there anything in here that you are just burning to answer in this list that we have not gotten to? We'll give you all a moment to pick one that you think you all could collaborate on here. Uh, and for those of you who have answered questions and we have not gotten to your questions, um, we will be sharing the list um, with the PSTs here for um, to answer offline. Guys, uh, Alfred's question is interesting. Which Scrum event would you eliminate if asked in an interview? I was looking at that one too, so let's do it. Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just like, I, it's like asking which of these four table legs would you eliminate? Like, it, the table is not going to work anymore. Uh, they they all serve a critical function. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a PST and I have to like, that's not, they all serve a critical function. It, you eliminate sprint planning. What What's your goal for the sprint? You eliminate sprint review. How, how are you going to get feedback on what you actually produced and, and inspect it? You eliminate the retrospective. You're not going to improve. Eliminate the daily scrum. You're going to carry impediments longer than you need to. And you're going to be much less nimble. Like none of them are optional they also what, have a function. Yeah, what most people like to eliminate and they don't even realize they're doing it is the concept of a sprint, a time box period yeah. of time in which you produce and increment and, and accomplish a goal. And so if you go infinity amount of time just working, 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 no one gets any value. You don't get any feedback. You don't have any pivot points. And that rem reminds me a lot of waterfall, two years before you have anything useful done. How about this? We all go to getting our paychecks every two years. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to do that, but anyway, I diverged. Yeah, I, I, all of the, all of the events serve a critical function in Scrum in order to make the framework operate. And if you start removing pieces, it's like removing legs off a table. Eventually, yeah. it doesn't function as a table anymore. Or, or load bearing walls of a house. You, you have a lot of freedom within the house how you can arrange and build within your house. You have a ton of freedom in the Scrum framework. You just can't take a sledgehammer to a load bearing wall and expect the house to stay standing. Great, thank you. All right, so we are almost at our time. I think we do have time for one more. That was a pretty quick cool um, Let's do it. So we'll take this question here. Uh, what metrics or KPIs do you track to show you are being effective as a scrum master? I just saw that one. I was excited to get involved mm -hmm. in that one. <laughs> well, get involved. <laughs> I mean, Rob, it kind of piles on the last answer we just said yes like, here's the one thing you need to be doing it's producing a solution to a problem some sort of accomplishment of a goal every sprint if you can't do that one thing i honestly don't care what other kpis you're tracking 
uh, because they might be misleading you, like lines of code written, bugs fixed. You know what? What's better than fixing bugs is not creating them in the first place or yeah. not having to maintain code no one uses. So uh, without focusing on increments and really, really, really focusing on who that customer is and delivering something useful every single sprint and learning from it, um, nothing else matters. And then beyond that, what else is useful? Things that help make you more predictable in terms of, of your ability to deliver. So if I can predictably and reliably produce increments every sprint, what's even better than that? Um, increments that I can get out the door faster. So your release frequency might be more interesting. Uh, number of happy customers that are coming in. Number of active users, if you're building a website. Um, net promoter score. Uh, and then we can get into a whole collection of like EBM kind of things that Greg would be a lot more qualified to talk about than myself. Um, but can I answer, right. yeah, can I answer the question behind this question, which I think might be happening? Um, I, I had a client ask me, like, I think we should measure carryover. What do you think? And instead of answering the question, I threw it back to her and I said, what do you think I'm going to say about this? She's like, I think you're going to say that if we measure carryover, people are just going to artificially game that metric and break their work down smaller and 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 not pull as much into sprint planning, that they're going to just adjust to what they're measured on. Like, yep, bingo. Like, if you're getting pressured to do a certain KPI and you don't think it's valuable, engage in a conversation and maybe don't just give your opinion, but help them get to what could go wrong with focusing on this KPI. I've seen that quite a bit. That's great. Thank you. All right, so with that, um, let's wrap up here. And as I mentioned, we will be sharing the open questions. We do have quite a few. We tried to get to as many as possible. And uh, yeah, we did our best here. So just wanna share some quick resources here. So please check out the learning paths on the scrum.org website. It's a great way to continue your learning. There's lots of different resources in there like white papers, case studies, webinars like this one. So please feel free to check that out. And with that, please stay connected with the scrum.org community through our social media channels and our blog and our webcasts that we run a couple times a month here. And I would like for Jason, Greg, and Rob to share the best ways that you can be connected. I see that Greg dropped in his LinkedIn. Um, so how to best connect with you all. Besides Greg, we know that Greg is on LinkedIn. Yep. I'm going to drop in my LinkedIn as well. I, I got to go find my LinkedIn. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Oh, here we go. I think this is me. This is me. <laughs> there we go. All right. That is great. All right. So thank you, everybody, for attending today. And thank you so much to Jason, Greg, and Rob. This has been a lot of fun. And I hope the audience got some great things out of it. So thank you all and scrum on. <laughs>